Kangaroo Woman. Not all superheroes wear capes, and not all of them live in the States. Skippy Butler, or Betty according to her birth certificate, wasn't like other superheroes. She had a vagina for a start. She also had powerful legs, big feet and a small head, as well as a pouch called a marsupium. It came in handy for carrying her keys and her mobile phone. She'd had her powers for as long as she could remember. Her parents had told her that when she was three years old, she'd wandered off when they were camping in the outback. It had been the middle of the night and they'd been miles from help, and so her parents had set out to look for her with powerful handheld torches and a growing sense of unease and despair. They'd found her at a watering hole, gnawing at the grass with the other joeys. They never learned what transpired in those missing hours, but in the months and years that followed, Skippy had started to change. The family dentist had pronounced himself stumped by her molars and incisors, which were poorly suited for human food but which seemed perfectly developed for grazing. The two sides of her lower jaw grew apart, giving her a wide bite and a mouth that looked too large for her little face. Puberty had been a f***ing nightmare. Her parents had tried to console her. Kangaroos are incredible creatures, her mother had said, and you're joining a long line of Aussie tradition. You could join the Air Force, her father had added. There are roos all over the gear and the uniform. I'd rather just be a normal person, Skippy had replied. But as she'd grown older, she'd also learned more of injustice, which permeated the world like a ghost pepper in a curry. Skippy had grown closer to nature, and she'd learned to commune with the wildlife in her garden. They lived in a backwater of a town that had been all but forgotten by the big cities, and the butler house was just beyond what passed for the city limits. Their nearest neighbour was half a mile away, and the house itself had been half swallowed by the snakes in the bushes. She spoke to the animals every day, although she had no way of knowing how much they understood. Either way, they never attacked her, and after a few scares and understandable overreactions, her parents had learned to take a back seat. Skippy was very different to the other kids. At school she was something of a loner, and she was often the target of abuse from her classmates. She didn't look like them, and she didn't think like them. On the rare few occasions when one of the other kids had tried to start a fight with her, she'd knocked them senseless with a formidable right hook. They were scared of her, and that was how she liked it. It didn't help that she was shy and retiring, just like her fellow ruse. She presented no threat to other students, and she didn't attack without provocation. But if she was backed into a corner and threatened with bodily harm, she could hold her own. Her only friend was her little brother, Terry. There was an eight-year age difference between the two of them, but they'd bonded with one another because of their shared love of the nature that surrounded them. And so it was no surprise that when Betty became Kangaroo Woman, Terry became her sidekick, Wallaby Boy. People from Skippy's town didn't go to university. It just wasn't the done thing. Most of them left school at 16 and started work on the family farms, while the girls looked for husbands and prepared to live as housewives. When Skippy left school, she took a different route, making a living of sorts as an animal wrangler for hire. Most of her clients were the kids that she'd gone to school with, or members of their extended families. The fact that they didn't like her wasn't enough to stop them from seeking her out completely. Her uncanny knack for working with animals was common knowledge, as was anything else out of the ordinary in the backwater of a town. She still lived with her parents, who had no idea that their daughter was living a double life. By day, Skippy Butler captured and rehoused dangerous animals. By night, she was Kangaroo Woman, a vigilante superhero with a difference. She'd first learned about poachers when she was a teenager, and she'd been reading everything she could get her hands on that talked about her country's wildlife. She'd been horrified to learn that wild kangaroos were hunted down for their meat and hides. Some people thought that the meat was healthier than other meats because kangaroos didn't have as much fat as, say, a pig. Skippy didn't know about that, though. She was the only vegan she knew, and when people made jokes about her eating grass, they didn't know how close to the truth they were. Her tendency to eat like a roux had a further layer, and one which had left her parents worrying that she was struggling with bulimia. Every now and then, after a particularly tough batch of grass, Skippy would regurgitate it, chew it as could, and then swallow it again. Luckily for her, she'd never been asked on a date, and so she'd never found herself doing it at a swanky restaurant. When she was kangaroo woman, Skippy raced through the wilderness at speeds of up to 25 miles per hour, although she had to slow down when she had Wallaby Boy at her side. She had a radio that she used to listen in on the poachers' communications, and had an uncanny knack for tracking them down. When she found them, she made them wish that she hadn't. Skippy's kangaroo powers meant that she could fight better than any boxer, and her fast reaction times allowed her to dodge the occasional bullets when the poachers were armed. Mostly, she just beat them into bloody pulps and left them there. If she found them for a second time, she showed them no mercy, just as they showed no mercy to the ruse that they hunted. On one occasion, she'd chased the poachers through the outback, first on foot and then in the back of their off-roader. They'd come to a ravine and abandoned the car, then made their way across on the back of a ladder, which they tossed away as soon as they'd reached safety. They'd thought they were safe, and they'd stuck around to taunt their pursuer once she caught up with them. 
but they'd underestimated her. Skippy had turned round and taken a few steps away, which had caused the poachers to start hooting and hollering. But their victory had been short-lived, because she'd turned around and raced up to the edge of the ravine, then launched herself through the air on her powerful legs and landed right in the middle of them. Then she'd reared up and sent them scattering into the night, but she'd tracked down each and every one of them by the time that the dawn came. She made sure that none of them would ever poach again. On another occasion, she'd chased the poachers into a river, which they'd attempted to ford on foot. There had been a strong current, but kangaroos are decent swimmers, and Skippy had put in plenty of practice in the sea and at the nearest municipal swimming pool, which was a one-hour drive away. She followed her prey into the river and pounced on them one by one, holding them beneath the water with her forepaws. She took each of them to the brink of drowning and then dragged them across to the other side, where she left them coughing and heaving. She miscalculated with one of them and the man drowned, but it was no great loss. As well as her powerful legs, Skippy also had a tail, which was difficult for her to hide unless she wore baggy pants and took care when she sat down. Her tail was a secret weapon, helping out with her balance and working like a third leg when she had to pick up speed. When she was with other people, she walked on two legs. When she was hunting poachers in the outback, she added her tail into the mix. Her pouch came in useful too. From time to time, she'd rescue injured animals, like when she'd found a bird and returned it to its nest. She also used it to store any ID that the poachers were carrying so that she could alert the authorities, anonymously of course, and let them know that they might want to send out some cop cars and an ambulance. Skippy Butler knew more about kangaroos than anyone. That was one of the reasons why she got so annoyed with people. Her secret identity wasn't particularly secret and the local papers occasionally ran stories on Kangaroo Woman, the anti-poaching crusader who worked outside the law. When they did, they invariably asked Skippy for a comment with mixed results. On one occasion, she chased a journalist off the family property and all of the way back to town, toying with the man by keeping her speed low so that he was always a dozen yards ahead of her. His mistake? He trotted out the same old story. I understand that Sir Joseph Banks was the first to write about the kangaroo, he said. Correct, Skippy replied. He was sailing with James Cook on the Endeavour. They spotted a roo at Cooktown while the Endeavour was being repaired after a run-in with the Great Barrier Reef. I see you've done your research. And I see you've done yours. I assume you know the story about how they got their name, the journo said. Cook asked one of the locals what they were called and they said kangaroo, which meant I don't know. And because they didn't speak the language, he thought that was what they were called. Skippy stiffened and said, that's an urban legend and one that I don't think it's appropriate to repeat. There's enough misinformation about kangaroos as is. The journalist shook his head and said, I think you've been misinformed. I think you'd better get off my property, Skippy replied. When the man refused and continued to press her with questions, she started hopping. Before either of them knew it, he'd hit the road and she was chasing after him. When Skippy had first started hunting the hunters, she'd struggled with her empathy, but she'd soon found that she had to be tough if she wanted to stop them from returning. Scaring them away wasn't enough because they'd just come back a few days later. She'd learned to put her empathy behind her and to break a limb or two, and she was helped by the fact that she saw herself as the missing link between the ruse and the humans. An injured human was a better result than a dead kangaroo. Her research had helped her there too. Whenever she was tempted to go easy, she thought about the aptly named John Gore, one of Cook's officers who'd shot a kangaroo and transported its skin and skull to England, where it had been taxidermied and put on display to the general public. Whenever she felt a twinge of remorse for going in heavy-handed, she thought of John Gore. Human beings were the main predators for the ruse, and she was the main predator of the human beings. Skippy died when she was 25 years old, a good age for a roo, but nothing at all for a human. It wasn't a poacher that got her in the end, although they'd had their moments. Instead, it was a jet black Land Rover that had been driving on a back road without its headlights on. 90% of Australian animal collisions involved kangaroos, and Skippy became just another statistic. In a cruel twist of irony, the Land Rover was being driven by a conservationist who'd been on a way to a call-out. There were poachers on the reservation, and someone needed to stop them. But Kangaroo Woman and Wallaby Boy would be no help, not then and not ever again. The conservationist didn't know whether to call paramedics or an out-of-hours vet. It became a moot choice as Betty Butler died in her arms in the darkness, her marsupial blood mixing with the dust and returning to the soil to nurture the wildlife that she'd come from.